Hello, how are you today? My name is Crazy Dog Wolf. I come from the Wolf's Den Forge, yes. Today we are going to be drinking Shiner Bob and we will be talking about sword myths. Wait, what the hell am I talking about? Anyway, <coughs> sword myths. I hear about them all the time, constantly, all day, every day. So, I'm going to answer them for you. Here we go. Firstly, I need to open this beer. <coughs> because debunking beat bullcrap is thirsty work. <coughs> to give you a little bit of background, among other things, besides being a professional blacksmith armor and making and selling weapons, I also travel around the country and I sell weapons full time. I moonlight for a friend of mine, <coughs> as well as selling my own weapons in various Ren fairs and art shows and blade shows and so on and so forth across the country. So I talk to thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people every single year about blades and you would not believe the most ridiculous crap that people I either hear them telling their friends in the booth or they try to tell me this as if the guy working in the sword booth clearly doesn't know how blades work so here's a few of my favorites number one blood groove dude swords have a blood groove it makes you bleed more man or you'll hear <laughs> You're hearing them say something equally as silly as releases the vacuum so when you pull the blade, you know, when you go to yank the blade out, it doesn't get stuck, dude. Alright, let me take these in turn. <laughs> Number one, it has absolutely nothing to do with bleeding. None whatsoever. You can make the deepest groove in the world you want to in a blade. It's not going to make somebody bleed more when you stab them. Why? Because when you stab somebody with something, the flesh curls up around it and, you know, clamps down on it and it creates a plug. You don't bleed that way. Take any first aid course, and the very first thing they're gonna tell you is if you run across somebody who's been stabbed with something or impaled on something, they'll say, for the love of God, don't pull it out. Because as long as you don't pull it out, it doesn't bleed, right? Big groove, doesn't make any difference. You stab somebody with it, as long as it's in there, it's not bleeding, not until you take it out. And the second one being the releasing the vacuum business. <laughs> First of all, the cross-section of the human body is, wait, like this, you know, this way, cross-section, is nowhere near enough to create and or exert a sufficiently strong vacuum on a blade, with, which has an extremely small, um, you know, surface area to it, to actually stick it and hold it into a body. That's not going to happen. So having a groove on the blade is not going to release the mythical vacuum and let you pull your blade out. If you can pull your blade out of somebody just as easily as they stuck it in them, actually a little bit easier. Unless you've hit a bone. That's a whole other story. So, first of all, it's not called a blood groove. It's a fuller. And the actual purpose of a fuller in the blade is to lighten the blade and strengthen it at the same time. And it does this by creating an elongated channel all the way through the blade to remove a lot of material, but at the same time, it's like a corrugation in a thin piece of steel. Take like your, uh, your shed, right? Thin little flimsy metal roof. If it's flat, you step on it, you fall right through it corrugate it like this, you know, like a ruffles chip or something, it becomes very, very strong, you know, for a very thin piece of metal. So you can step on it and it's a lot stronger, right? Same idea. You put opposing corrugations in a blade, you're removing a great deal of material, you make it much stiffer. It's a lot like a smooth I-beam instead of having harsh square edges. It's a nice, you know, little round trough. So it makes the blade lighter, makes the blade stronger. It has nothing to do with blood, nothing to do with vacuum. Okay. And another one. <laughs> People walk up and pick up one of our blades, which are nice and light, and go, well, this isn't a real sword, man, because real swords weigh like 30 or 40 pounds. Oh, for f <laughs> sake. Really? Okay. Let's think about this logically for a minute. If a sword weighed 30 pounds, how many times are you going to be able to swing that on a battlefield? Yeah, maybe once, if you're really, really lucky. Back in the medieval days, Dark Ages days, you know, pre-enlightened times like today, where we just shoot each other. <laughs> sword fights could go on for, you know, well, not sword fights, individual sword fights, but, you know, mass battles could go on for hours, sometimes days. So you'd have to swing the sword for hours upon hours at a time. If you get a sword that weighs 10, 20, 30, 40 pounds, you're not going to swing it more than one or two times before you're too tired to even defend yourself. And that's worse than useless. It will get you killed. A real weapon should be light well-balanced and easy to use, while at the same time being extremely durable. So, 
there's that one. And on to another one. <clears throat> if I had a dollar for every time... I don't really get this one in person, but if I had a dollar for every time I'd been on a website or a forum or something like that, and saw somebody describing how swords are made when a newbie asked me, like, well, the first thing you do is you melt all down the steel and you pour it into a mold. Ugh. Okay. This comes from the original Conan movie and the remake of Conan and Game of Thrones when they're reforging the Valyrian sword and they show them pour it all out into molds and also various animes. And this is complete and total crap. If you want to make a blade that you're absolutely going to guarantee is going to break, the best way to do this is to cast it in a mold, right? Iron or even steel castings are, you know, have huge nodular grain structures to them. They tend to be very, very brittle, and they tend to break. If you want to see this in action, all you simply have to do is go take any piece of cast iron, a die cast piece, anything. Go take it out and hit it with a hammer and watch what happens to it. It's going to break. What do you think is going to happen to your sword if you swing it at somebody, hit another sword, hit a shield, hit an armored helmet or something like that, it's going to break. So, yeah, no, that's not the way it's done. Even if you were to take the, mold, the, the, the casting and then try to forge it out later, it's not the way this works. So, no, that is not the way it's done. I honestly think that this has to have its genesis in, uh, in documentaries of uh, Bronze Age swords, right? Because that's exactly how you make a bronze sword. That's exactly how you make a bronze sword. It is not how you make an iron or steel sword. It's not at all. Okay, anyway, moving on. <sighs> this one. Oh my god, people wear me out with this one. <sighs> What's the best sword in the world, and why is it the katana? Oh, Jesus Christ. Really? Alright, let's... Yeah. <clears throat> First of all, Saying there's a best sword in the world, people ask me that all the time. You know, what's the best sword in the world? And they'll say, ooh, is the katana the best sword in the world? And I'll look at them and say, what's the best tool in the world? A hammer or a screwdriver? And they stop and they give them this blank look like, qua? And, uh, and that's exactly what they should have, right? You know, a, a, a weapon is a tool, just like anything else. It doesn't matter if we're talking about knives, swords, axes, shotguns, you know, machine guns or nuclear weapons. They're tools. Each one has a very specific job to do. It is important to have the proper tool for the proper job. Therefore, the best sword at any given time depends on what you're going to do with it. Are you going to try to slash your way through boiled leather, silk, and bamboo laminated Japanese armor? Then yes, the katana is the best weapon in the world at the time. If you're trying to pound your way through, or cleave your way, more specifically I should say, through steel European style armor, then no. You know, a European style longsword, bastard swords, Vihand or something like that is more along the outlines of what you need. So at that given time, that's the proper sword. If you're simply in foppy gentlemanly clothes leaving the theater and get into a duel with somebody on the street, you know, rapier, small sword, uh, something of this nature is what, you know, more what you're going to want. So there's really there's no such thing as the best sword in the world. So that's like asking somebody what the best ice cream flavor in the world is. It's going to depend on the situation or depend on the person in that case. Anyway, moving on. Another one of my favorites, which also has to deal with katanas. Oh my god, people wear me out with katanas. Anyway, not that I hate katanas. I'll do a whole other video on katanas, but it's just, my god, the amount of people that fetishize the katanas, the greatest weapons, ridiculous. And, of course, you know, most of what they know about them is absolutely wrong. So anyway, another one about katanas. I have people coming all the time, like, dude, my... Brody has a katana that was folded like 10,000 times, man. Oh. <laughs> no, 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 no. Nobody ever folded a blade 10,000 times or 5,000 times or 2,000 times. This is not the way it works, right? You may run across a blade that has ten th tens of thousands of layers in it, right? You could even find classical examples of some of the old katanas that have literally millions of layers in them, right? It does not mean they were folded that many times. The way this works, all right, so let me give a little bit of background really quickly. Every time you hit a piece of steel with a hammer, you're doing damage to it. Every time you heat it up, especially to a very high welding heat, which is required to fold and, and weld, you're doing damage to it, right? So the trick is to hit it with a hammer as few times as humanly possible, to heat it as few times as may possible, to bend it, manipulate it as few times as possible. So if you were to just to fold a piece of steel over 10,000 times, besides being a ridiculous waste of fuel and effort and time, um, you're actually going to slowly decarburize that steel and, and destroy it. So there's no reason to do that. It's ridiculous. Now, the reason why you get these many layers to it is simple uh, ge 
Mm, uh, geometric progression. Yay, brain worked. Whee! Okay, geometric progression. How geometric progression works is very simple, right? So, man, my tongue and my brain are not friends today, so please excuse me. <clears throat> and no, I'm probably not going to any of this crap out. You're just going to have to listen to me sound like a while I'm doing this. Anyway, no offense to my friends. Anyway, enough of this. Geometric progression is very simple. If you fold a piece of paper over uh, one time, you don't have one layer anymore. You have two, right? Very obvious. If you fold again, you have four, then eight, then 16. 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024, 248, 496, etc. Right? All of a sudden, you have a geometric progression. These, these, these folds start expanding very, very greatly. So within two dozen folds, that's only 24 times, you can have 16 billion with a B, 777,216 layers, just with two, two dozen folds. No, dumbass. It's 16 million with an M, 777,216 layers. Bad dog, no beer for you! No. So no, your katana wasn't folded 10,000 times. It was really folded like 10, 12, you know, somewhere in between one to two dozen is more reasonable. So, on to the next one. Okay, on to another one. Where were we? Uh, which, you know, you guys didn't see this, but I got interrupted. So, a little bit of a cut here. Now we're going to get back to it. Excuse me. Let's see how. Oh, one of my favorite ones. Oh, swords are razor sharp, man. If the blade's not sharp enough to cut you with, it's done. No. And yes, but mostly no. <clears throat> Again, so we you know, weapons are tools, swords are tools. It depends on what you're going to do with it. More specifically, when you're talking about uh, you know, historical weapons, it depends on where they came from in the world and what they were used for. If in societies where they had metal armor, you're very rarely going to find razor sharp swords, you know, like Europe, for example, until you progress into, you know, the Renaissance where they quit wearing, you know, really uh, steel armor and went on to just wearing street clothes and your blades got a lot sharper. But in the you know days of iron swords, or I mean, excuse me, steel armor, things like that, razor sharp swords, very, you know, very rare thing. You don't need a razor blade to cut through steel armor. You need a chisel, right? All you're going to do to a razor sharp blade is, is, is take chips off of it and destroy it. So razor sharp is not a very good idea. Now you go into places like uh, China, for example. Not a whole lot of steel armor, but a little bit. You know, so razor sharp swords a little bit more common. Go to Japan. The Japanese didn't have steel armor because iron and steel were very, very rare and extremely precious. So they used it for very important things like weapons and, and tools that could not be made of anything else. So their armor was a laminate of like bamboo, silk, and boiled leather which you absolutely had to have a razor sharp blade to get through. So, yes and no, depends on where you are. Anytime anybody picks up a medieval style weapon, you know, a medieval European style weapon, it's like, well, it's junk because it's not razor sharp, doesn't know what they're talking about. Really only the Asian weapons, even going up and through the Middle East, or depending on where you are in the Middle East, you'll find sharp swords. Anywhere else, not really so much. Where else? Uh, ooh, the flip side of that coin. European swords were totally dull, man. No. Again, they were tools with a very specific purpose. In Europe, metal armor was extremely widespread. It was ubiquitous, as a matter of fact. So, what is the easiest way to defeat this armor? To have a blade that is designed to cut through that armor. You don't need, again, going back to what I said a minute ago, you don't need a razor blade to cut through steel. You need a chisel, right? So you find blades that have like a 30 degree angle edge like this. You know, a lot like what you would find on a chisel or a brand new axe that hasn't been dressed properly to a sharp edge. And the reason for this being is it's, it's you know, you don't need a razor blade to cut through steel, you need a chisel. You have to have something with a chisel point through it to be able to cut through the steel armor. So, you know, it's a blade that's not dull, but if you put your thumb on it and ran it up and down, you're gonna have a hard time cutting yourself with it. It's not a really sharp blade, but at the same time, it's not dull. It's a very specific edge that's done for a very specific job. You know, dull would be completely rounded off and you could never harm yourself with it. A European style edge could very easily still take an arm, a leg, a head off. However, you can hit a piece of steel with it and not do a great deal of damage to the blade. As a matter of fact, you shouldn't be able to do any real serious damage to it at all because of the way that the blade is angled. Um, let's see. Oh, continuing on with the sharpness theme. You know, uh, swords have to be razor sharp to make a deep cut. You know, if your sword's not razor sharp, you're not going to cut anything. N no. Again, just like I said a minute ago, you can make every bit of a, you know, you can make a very serious deep cut. You can pop an arm and your head off with a 30 degree grind like you would find in a European blade, just as well as you can with a razor sharp blade by Katana. Now, at some point, 
I'm going to have to put my money where my mouth is and actually do a video of this. I should have videotaped it in the first place when I did it, but I did not. What I'm talking about is a couple years back, I had a customer come into uh, our booth at the Maryland Fair, Maryland Renaissance Festival, and, uh, and asked me the exact same question. Can you make every bit as deep a cut with a European-style blade as you can with a razor-sharp one? And being you know, a trained scientist as, like, as I am, I said, I don't know. That's a good question. Let's find out. So I designed an experiment for this. And what I ended up doing was taking a whole bunch of baseballs. So if you never try to cut a baseball with anything, be it a, a frickin' bandsaw or a blade or whatever, or even a, even a hatchet, you know, they're very difficult to cut through. Took a bunch of baseballs, and I had borrowed a razor-sharp competition-style cutting katana from my friend William Lloyd at Lloyd Studios. And uh, we set it all up, set a bunch of baseballs, and I took the razor-sharp cutting katana and popped through those baseballs, as you would imagine, very easily, very clean, perfect cuts, you know, not a whole lot of, of effort to go through them. You know, very nice sharp blade. And then I took one of our swords that has uh, a 30 degree grind on it, like you would find a typical European blade, you know, this armor piercing style of edge. And set up the uh, baseballs and believe it or not, made every bit of clean and easy cuts all the way through them, just as easily, just as cleanly as I did with a razor sharp blade. And again, like I said, I'm going to have to make a video of this. Now that I've said it, I'm gonna have to back it up. So I will at some point, I promise you, I will, make a cutting video on this exact topic but you know I proved to myself and my customer and our friends around us because none of us knew and, you know all the rest of the guys who worked in the booth William didn't know that so we all decided to find out you make this a fact finding mission is that really true no it's not true you don't have to have a razor sharp blade to make a, a super deep super effective cut a 30 degree grind like you'd find a European armor, start, armor style cutting edge does just as well okay and on to one of my absolute favorites I feel bad for people, you know, sometimes. I don't want to, like, crush anyone's hopes and dreams when they come in and say something ridiculous to me. Unless they're being, you know, kind of a jackass about it, in which case I have absolutely no compunctions to mercy in any way, shape, or form. But the average person, you know, comes in and asks questions. I really don't want to... Uh, I don't want to disappoint them. But it's really hard when somebody walks in and says, Dude, I got this sword from the mall for, like, $100. It's totally battle-ready. Right? <laughs> you may notice there's a lot of face palming in this video, and I do a lot of this in real life. I really do look at people and go, Ah, yeah, that already. Sure. No, man. I've got bad news for you. If you have a sword and it says Pakistan, India, China, or the dreaded words stainless on it, yeah, it's not a battle ready sword, man. I'm really sorry to tell you that, but it's not. You can kid yourself as much as you want, it just isn't. I can't tell you how many people will try to eat, you know, they've convinced themselves so much they try to convince me. It's like, it's not going to happen, you can't, I, yeah, anyway. They really aren't, they really are not. Just like I sell my customers all the time, swords are tools, right? Knives are tools, axes are tools. Good tools are not cheap, and cheap tools are not good. I don't care what the guy selling it told you. You're not going to come up with a really good, very high quality, armor cutting, battle ready blade for a hundred bucks or 50 bucks or, eh, you know, maybe a hundred, you know, $150 is not going to happen. 200 depends if the guy selling to you is really dumb, but it's not going to happen. You're not going to find a really extremely high quality tool cheaply. This brings me to the ultimate question. After I dispel these people's myths as they stand in the booth and they rattle on their, their various, you know, ill-conceived ideas to me and I shoot them all down and they go, well, how do I know if what I'm looking at is a really good high-quality weapon? This is very easy, okay? It doesn't matter the manufacturer. It doesn't matter where it was made. I mean, it, that really, it kind of does. But for the most part, this holds true around the world. The number one thing I tell people is don't listen to whatever the salesperson tells you, Okay. I hate to break this to you, as somebody who does a lot of sales, I can tell you this is true. Uh, a salesperson's job is to lie to you and take your money, right? To tell you what you want to hear, to be able to get your debit card or your cash out of your wallet and put it in their pocket. It's very simple like that. <clears throat> so, you know, if they can tell you, well, the sword will do this and the sword will do that, that's great. You know, it's probably a bunch of BS. So how do you cut to the chase and actually find out whether what you're looking at is a real high quality weapon? Very simple. All you simply have to do is ask one question. Preferably get some documentation to back this up, but really there's one question. Look them in the eye and ask them, 
does this weapon come with a lifetime guarantee against major damage to the blade? If the answer to this question is yes, it is an extremely high quality weapon that is battle ready, if you like to say that, combat quality, whatever you like to call them. It is a real weapon that you could actually fight with and will survive actual combat. If the answer to that question is no, I don't care what kind of BS they told you, I don't care what kind of cute videos they have on their website of them slicing ham and slicing ropes and whatever the hell, it's not a real weapon. It's crap. If they won't back it up with a lifetime guarantee, it's because they know you're going to break it. People who back their weapons up with a lifetime guarantee guarantee them because you should not be able to break it unless they did something wrong making it. 99 times out of 100, if you break a battle, you know, a battle-ready weapon, a real quality weapon, 99 times out of 100, it's not because you did something wrong using it. It's because the person who made it did something wrong making it. They didn't have enough coffee that morning and flubbed the temper because they weren't paying attention, or there was a the inclusion or a, a flaw in the, in, the, in the blade seal that they weren't aware of, something of that nature. You know, a real, real high-quality weapon should be damn near indestructible and come with a guarantee. So... That covers a lot of the crap that I hear on a regular basis at all around the country at first constantly about myths that people think about swords, particularly. There, this, you know, there's a lot more when it comes to knives and, and axes and things like that, but that's most of it when it pertains to swords. So if you have any questions, if you call BS on whatever I've said, if there is something that I did not cover that you would like to hear, by all means, leave me some comments below and I will be more than happy to address them. Thanks guys, and if you enjoyed this video, or if you think I'm at least not a complete jackass, please like the video and consider subscribing to my channel. Thanks, have a spectacular evening. Mm.